Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce to you uh, Esther Duflo, the, uh, the Abdul Latif Jamal Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development at MIT. So Esther, Esther Duflo is uh, the, the co-founder and the director of the Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT. She, She's the winner of just dozens of awards. Uh, the Elaine Bennett Prize for Research of the American Economics Association, the prize for the best young French economist a few years ago. Just a couple days ago, she won a MacArthur Foundation grant, commonly known as the Genius Awards. Um, no one deserves it better than she does. I could go on and on, or, or you could read the program. Um, so, so a better way of spending a, a couple minutes with you might be to tell you a little bit about Esther's contributions. Um, Professor Duflo has been a force of nature in, in showing us the value of randomized experiments, both for the evaluation of development interventions and in combination with economic theory for understanding economic behavior and the structure of economic institutions in poor countries. She's also, we've always known that the, that the fable of perfectly rational utility maximizing agents is just that, a fable. Professor Duflo has shown us that in certain circumstances, that fable is profoundly misleading. One has to pay attention to the reasons why people behave the way they do. She's got substantive contributions all over the map in development economics. She's taught us about the economics of education, technological change in agriculture, household behavior, gender relations in the marriage market, financial markets, microfinance impacts in organization, the way the banking system works in poor countries. Uh, work on health, aging, indoor air pollution, work on infrastructure. I could go on and on. Or I could give you better advice and just tell you to read her papers. She writes beautifully and accessibly. Um, it's, it's, you should just read her papers. So instead, I'll just use my last one minute to say very briefly that in an extraordinarily short period of time, Esther Duflo has made more substantive change to the shape of academic economics than almost anybody working in the field today. And, and more importantly than that, those changes that she's made in our field are having a direct effect in the world, and people are better off as a consequence. So please listen carefully and think hard as Esther tells us about developing rural areas. So at the end, we should have plenty of time for questions, so store up your questions as she goes. Esther, you're Thank you very much. I think the, the safest thing to do right now would be to stop and not say anything, because uh, it's downhill from there. Um, so as a disclaimer, I'm not going to talk about randomized evaluations, neither in, as a principle, nor in a sense am I going to talk much about uh, any results from them. Well, like a few here and there, but not that much. So I hope this is not what you came for. Uh, instead, uh, I thought I would display my French, uh, my good French education by uh, presenting, uh, by writing a talk which is in three parts and three subparts, uh, which is how uh, one is supposed to write uh, any paper or any talks. And I thought this is, uh, after all, I don't have often the occasion to actually write in three parts and three subparts, because usually there is some substance along the way that will detract you from that. Um, so here are my three parts. Uh, why? So the, the title was given to me uh, as an assignment. Uh, the, so after that, it's for me. So my three parts would be why, uh, what, and how. Uh, so why is really why rural area as opposed to urban areas? And the three subparts are because people are there. Uh, the second one is because they are not going away. And the third one is because we don't really want them to go away because that would create all sorts of issues. Uh, so let me start with the beginning. So uh, that may seem a sort of uh, maybe something obvious that uh, most people are in rural area. But in fact, uh, when you read uh, the popular press, and not only the popular press, sort of what is in psyche in a lot of policymakers, is really not rural poverty. It's all about urban poverty. So the issue is like you read statements such that in the 21st century, the problem of poverty is going to be an urban one. 
uh, people have in mind, you know, arriving by train in the city of Bombay and seeing like these slums like uh, expanding and at the same time expanding and becoming denser and denser. So uh, people have these views of crowds uh, uh, leaving the countryside and, and, and flooding the cities and therefore the idea is that that's going to be the problem. And indeed, uh, the, the number of poor people has reduced in rural area and it has increased in cities. So that's maybe one of the reasons why people think that. But when you think about it, like the, the urbanization rate worldwide in poor country is still relatively low. So at, as of 2002, 42% of people lived in urban area. In a country like India, which is both known, I guess, for a lot of growth in the past 20 years and like large cities, I think people have in mind Bombay as one of the big cities, for example, the urbanization rate as of 2001 was only 24%. What is interesting is that it's, uh, and it's in a paper by uh, Ravalian, Chen, uh, Chen and Shangola, is that it is particularly tr true for the poor that the vast majority of the poor uh, live in rural areas still. So in 2002, uh, the, if you use the $1 a day poverty line, and if you adjust for the cost of living in urban area, so it's a one it's a one dollar purchasing power equivalent in urban and rural, uh, the poverty rates worldwide was 30 percent in rural area and 13 percent in urban area as of 2002. So three quarters of the developing world's poor still live in the rural areas. So that's the first point. That's where people are there are, and the second point is that this is not. This is not, it hasn't changed from something which was even higher a long time ago. If you're looking at 1993, the numbers were not very different from what we see in 2002. So for the world, it was the head country, the, uh, the head country ratio was, uh, sorry, my, my slides are muddled. 38% of the world, 38% uh, of people lived in urban, in, in, uh, urban area, so it hasn't changed all that much. It, in, in India, it was 22% as of 1991. So the urbanization rates hasn't changed very much between 91 and 2000, neither in the world nor in India. And if you look at the equivalent, what is the headcount ratio in urban and rural area, it used to be 37% in rural area in 1993, and 14% for in, in urban area. So it's not something that has changed all that much. So in levels, it seems to be that most of the poor are still in rural areas, and in trend, it's also the case. It doesn't mean that it's not going to change one day, so that people are all suddenly going to change that mind and go, but it doesn't seem that it's happening uh, as of now. Uh, and this, the fact that you don't see a, a, lot of, a lot more people living in urban area or a lot more of the poor living in urban area in, 19, in 2002 compared to 1993, suggests that there hasn't been that much migration uh, from rural to urban area. In particular, that there hasn't been many pa permanent migration with people shifting and establishing residence in the city. And in fact, this fits with what we see in the data. Uh, we have, a, um, Abhijit Banerjee and I have a paper where, which is a descriptive paper on various aspects of the economic lives of the poor. And one of the things we, we look at in various countries, we look at various aspects of the life of the poor. I'm going to draw a lot on this evidence in this talk. And one of the things you see is that if you ask, most surveys ask people where they were born, and you see that among poor people in urban area, most people were born in urban area. They, they didn't come uh, from rural area. So that's another sign of like a relatively low migration. However, what is frequent, so permanent migration is, seems relatively low uh, by any, any standards, and urbanization is not very rapid. What is very much more frequent is temporary migration. So in part, the urbanization is a little bit miscounted because the, temp the permanent migrant, the temporary migrants are still counted in, in rural area, even if they are in the city for some fraction of the time. So that's the reason why you may have some discrepancy between your impression when you arrive in the city that there really are a lot of people who are living in very precarious conditions and the, uh, the census number which will tell you, no, everybody lives in rural area really. Uh, so, for example, in, in data that we collected as well with, with Abhijit in a, in a district in India, Udaipur district, which is a very rural, tribal, very poor district, 
we found that four households out of five had at least one member traveling, regularly traveling to an urban area to work. And when we mean traveling, it means they don't go and come back in the night. It means they, they spend at least a few nights out uh, for work reason. However, they don't go for very long. So we have these migration episodes, temporary migration episodes. They go alone, leaving their family behind. Or they go, the teenagers go in groups, again, leaving the family behind. And the median episode of, a migra of migration lasts for a month. And only 10% of the migration episodes are longer than three months. So what you have is people going for some time, uh, typically working on a construction sites, or working in a shop, or working in a restaurant, spending some time there coming back, going, coming back, going, coming back. So why do they do that? There are various possible explanations. I'm not going to go into you know, develop all of them, but there, there is kind of a lot of research behind all of these bullet points. Uh, one is that they have better insurance in the village and they don't, lo they don't want to lose access to those networks. So there was a, a very interesting theory paper by Banerjee and Newman looking at uh, exactly this question and showing how this could be a limit to migration, that you would only have the very poorest people or the very richest people leaving the middle people deciding to stay in order to keep uh, access to the insurance network. Well, temporary migration gives you sort of your cake and eat it because you can, you keep, you leave the, the family behind so you don't save, save your, the, the, the social links. A second reason but that people cite a lot when uh, you ask them the question is that the, the health environment is better. So, the, the, so they want their kids to stay behind because they wouldn't know where to put them and uh, they, there's no, uh, they would get sick and they, they, they would have trouble finding in school and this like that. The third reason I think we should, we should not underestimate is that it's much nicer. I think they like it there, like people have their, it's not only their social contacts for insurance, but it's also their friends and uh, extended family and things like that. However, there are costs to the fact that those migration uh, episodes are so temporary. And in particular, it's, it makes it very difficult to accumulate skills and contacts in order to be more efficient and productive in the city. So you see people, you know, if people keep going and working for a few weeks in a, in a construction site and coming back and going again and coming back, they, ha they don't have really the time to become skilled at anything. And one of the color, corollary of the fact that the migration episodes are very short is that a lot of these people shift job. Uh, every time they get a slightly different job and a lot of people uh, and, and stay unskilled at every kind of jobs they do. So that has the cost, uh, the fact that people don't move. So how would you, what could you do if you, if you wanted to encourage long -term, uh, more long-term migration? Well, if social insurance was better than the link to uh, maintaining the link to, uh, to, to the village would be less important. I think if cities were closer and we're going to go back to that, uh, if cities were closer or towns were closer, people would be more likely to want to, to be able to go there and stay there. And if, the, uh, if there was more either public or private infrastructure in the, in the cities, for example, uh, uh, if there was some enough of public investments to make it worthwhile for a private person to construct low-cost housings, then you could also have people deciding to move that with their, or to, move, to, to go there with their families. So that's kind of what you would want to do if instead Instead of developing uh, rural areas, you, you would want to develop cities such that people in the rural areas move to the cities. And you might want to do that because the productivity of a worker in a, in a rural area, for example, in India, is 28% of that in an urban area. However, you would have an issue if you wanted to do that, is that uh, you would have, a, sorry, you would have a, a large number of people uh, trying, to come, trying to go to, to the cities. So, that should be, uh, urbanization is probably not the response to the problem of rural poverty, in part because it's going to, uh, it, would, it would lead to a big increase in urban poverty. So for example, if you take India, if you wanted to go to the urbanization rate that we have now to uh, 30%, which is still lower than the world's average, uh, by 2011, you would need to move 120 million. 120 million people would need to move and find housing. And that's a large number of people. And in part, that's a large number of people, and a large number of people in the meantime, while they don't move and find housing, are a potential for huge disruptions. 
uh, and that's kind of a, that's a, that's a fear that sort of has always been there in development economics that the poor the, we will flood the cities and uh, it will become like a it will become a political disaster, and it hasn't happened. But in a sense, you can see why uh, you would these numbers can be daunting. So one sign of that is that in a sense this is already while the urbanization rate is very slow, even then the number of poor people is increasing in urban areas and it's decreasing in rural areas. So as it is, even with the slow uh, rate of increase in, in, in urbanization, you, you have more people in poor cities. So in between 93 and 2002, the number of poor people in urban areas has increased by 50 million in the world. And the number of, uh, of, um, of poor people in the countryside has decreased by 150 million. So that's, uh, uh, that's even though the rate is relatively low. This is of course not because cities make people poor, but because the poor people move from one place to another. And as they do that, that's one less poor person in the countryside and one more poor, one more poor person in the city. So if we think about it that way, so developing rural areas seem to be the only sustainable way to reduce poverty on a large enough scale. You cannot just say, well, let's go and focus exclusively on the city and assume that everything will fall. So that's for the why. Now, when we're talking about developing, uh, developing rural area, what do we think? What, like, what do you develop? What is there to develop? We'll be talking about, in some sense, the, the gap. So what is there to de develop? One is infrastructure and public goods. Uh, two is agriculture. And three is industry. So now I'm going to be talking about what, why this sector need to be developed, what there is to develop. And then after that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how what are potential, uh, potential avenues for, for policy. So in that uh, same uh, Economic Lives of the Poor uh, paper, which describes the way people under a dollar a day live in various countries, both in rural and in urban areas, uh, we find that the access to public goods is much, even though the poor don't want to leave the, the, uh, the rural area because they would move to slums, where a lot of the infrastructure, where the, the condition of life would be unpleasant because things are very crowded and things like that. The infrastructure that they have access to in the villages is worse along all dimensions. And it's pretty bad. And it depends from country to country, but it's pretty bad. So for example, we find that among those who are living below dollar a day in rural areas, less than 10% have access to tap water in, we have looked at, I think we have now 17 countries, except for three countries where it's higher, and even in those countries, not that high. In Nicaragua, it's almost 20%, Peru, 29%, Guatemala, 36 So if, you, if you're a poor person in urban area, basically, you don't have water in your house. Uh, there is more, much more variation in latrines, and there is also much more variation in electricity, where the Latin American country, almost everybody has electricity. In a place like Odaipur, nobody does. So that's kind of on the utility front. So that's sort of the very basic infrastructure. Uh, and then another dimension of the public goods is uh, health and school, sort of human capital infrastructure. And you may be familiar with that literature, uh, both the schools and the, and the uh, public health facilities are plagued with high, very high level of absenteeism. So on, a, on average, if you go, so uh, n n Michael Kramer and co-authors have worked uh, with the World Bank to send teams to uh, uh, either schools or public health centers during opening hours and just find, is it open and who is there, who is absent, who is present. And what they find is that in the countries that they look at, on average, about a quarter of the teachers are, are missing in any single visit. And furthermore, among the teachers who are there, about half are actually teaching. So on average, the students get about half of the student of the you know, face time uh, with their teacher that they should get. To that, you also need to, uh, to add to that the fact that the children are also absent a lot, but let's say that's their problem. Uh, but the result is that students uh, have access to about a quarter of the number of days that we expect they should be getting, which is uh, not very much. Uh, so uh, that's for schools. Uh, that's, and for health center, if you thought school were bad, health center is actually much worse. 
the rate of absenteeism in health centers is, uh, is about, is on average in their various countries, uh, almost half. And again, it varies from country to country. And we have similar data for Udaipur where we find that so about half the time the nurse is not there when you go to a public health facilities. And moreover, you would think, well, that's fine. You know, they make an, instead of coming the whole day, they come half day. And that's not so much of a problem. It's only the interviewer who doesn't find them, but it's not really a problem for the people as long as, long as they know. So in order to find this out, what we did is we sent someone 50 times once a week on a random day and a random, random time of the day to the health facility. And then we can run a model for each facility to try to predict when we should go if we want to find them. And it's impossible. Like there is no, it's not that they, they, they are there on Monday and not on Tuesday. Like you never know, they come whenever they have a chance. And that's, of course, that's, uh, it's not that the facilities are uh, wonderful in, in urban areas, but they are much better, at least on those dimensions. Uh, so that's one thing. Absenteeism is, you know, less if you're close to a road. It's even less if you're actually in a city. So it's really essentially a rural problem. Uh, and in addition, the, the quality of education is, is uh, so the, the, both the quality, both of education and the public uh, uh, facilities, the public health facility is low. So for the public health facility, Jis um, Nudas um, and Jeff Hammers have, have some research where they, they observe the doctors and they see how much time they spend with the patient. The average time spent with the patient is three minutes. And on average, there is no exams. People don't even touch your head. Uh, in, in India, in, a, in most countries, uh, in, in rural areas particularly, enrollment rates have increased very fast. In urban areas, they were higher to start with. So for example, in India, 98% of primary school age children are in school, which is good. But uh, according to the annual status of education report, which is a survey done all over in India, only about half can read a paragraph. So that's for the infrastructure that in public goods. So that's the first thing that you would think well, if you wanted to develop rural area, that's clearly an area of what progress could be made. Second, obviously, is agriculture. You would think, well, developing rural area, the one thing you think about is developing agriculture. And that's perfectly reasonable, uh, in f especially due to the fact that what the poor have, if they have anything, is a bit of land. What we, show, what we find, again, in this survey is that, uh, so we look at the assets that people have, and uh, almost all the poor have a, have a house. Uh, that's, that's fine. And a lot of them have some land, little piece of land that they farm, and usually not much else, including no table or chair or things like that. It's like land is really your one piece of asset if you're a poor person in a rural area. And as a result, a lot of people, a lot of the poor uh, in rural areas are self-employed in agriculture. That's not going to come to any uh, surprise, so in our surveys, it ranges from 36% in Albury Coast to 99% in Udaipur. So it seems to make, to be very sensible, the idea that developing rural area involves developing agriculture to allow uh, them to make the most out of their single asset. And an amazingly successful example of that is the Green Revolution in South Asia, which transform, uh, radically transform Indian agriculture as well as the agriculture of the neighboring countries uh, since starting in 1960s, multiplying the yield several folds and uh, changing India from a country that was dependent on, in, uh, on import to a country that is uh, more than self-sufficient. And today, what, again, something you hear a lot when, you're on, when people don't worry about urban poverty, they worry about agri productivity in agriculture, and in particular the fact that even in contrast to the green uh, revolution in India, uh, in Africa, for example, the, the, the yields are much lower, the use of various inputs is much lower, and so in generally agricultural technology is lacking behind. So there is today a call, and a lot of money behind this call, in particular the Gates Foundation is, is really putting a lot of effort behind that uh, for a new green revolution for Africa, which involves both uh, uh, developing high value crops, such as flowers and fruits and vegetables, uh, which can be uh, exported to, to Europe, for example, and also development of seeds and fertilizer that are appropriate to Africa, and also higher use of the existing seeds and fertilizer will go back to that. So that's 
maybe not uh, particularly surprising. What is a little bit more surprising, or maybe it's not surprising to you, but certainly was surprising to me, is that in fact, even though most people own a house and declare themselves as self-employed in agriculture, uh, that's really not the only thing they are doing. And in fact, it's in a lot of cases not the main thing they are doing. Um, so um, this uh, Andy Frost and Mike Rosenzweig use a very interesting data from India where you see the same villages over time uh, since the 1960s. And what they document is that the share, this is the distribution of primary activity of men. So this is what people report as their, as what they, their main source of income. And what you find is that over time, the, the share who declare uh, farming has uh, gone down a bit. And the share that, um, but what has really gone down is the share that report working for an agricultural wage. And instead, what people do is that they work for a non-agricultural wage or salary. So you have a big increase uh, between the 70s and the 80s and the 90s in the fraction of people who live in rural area, but for whom the prime source of activities is not, has nothing to do with agriculture. It, and if you look at people's If you look at people's uh, income, not only their primary activity, in the same data, you find that in the latest wave of the survey, half of rural income come from the non-agricultural sector. And the, the diverse, this diverse, so there is a great diversification in people's uh, sources of livelihood in a rural area. And it is not the case that people are entirely dependent on uh, agricultural income. In fact, they are less and less dependent on agricultural income. Furthermore, this, this diversification happens not only across households, but within households. So even people, for example, even people who claim that agriculture is their main activity also make money out of non-agricultural activities. So take Udaipur, for example, where we ask them the same question, what is your main source of income? Only 19% of the people report that self-employment in agriculture is their main source of income. And that is because Odaipo is quite dry and most of the time they probably cannot grow that much. So they all own their piece of land and they all do some farming and they all report themselves self-employed in agriculture, but most of their money comes from uh, these things as construction worker or uh, things like that. Uh, the more generally, so, so another India example is uh, a survey of West Bengal, which shows that now go into those who pretend, who, those who say that their primary activity is to farm their own land. So uh, even among them, farming occupies them for only 40% of the time. 60% of the time, they do other things, other kind of activities, a range of activities. Business, uh, non, um, non, non-farm business, working as employee, et cetera, et cetera. And lest you think that this is just like India, an India phenomenon, an Indian exception, this is really something we find everywhere. So uh, in the survey, we, uh, it's not always said what is your main source of income, but they usually have all the activities that people uh, uh, make money from. And you find that 50% uh, of households in Guatemala do more than one thing. So they are not only in farming, but they're also doing some other activities. 72% in Cote d'Ivoire. 84% in Guatemala, et cetera, et cetera. So the households are, you have, do a little bit of everything, and the rural households as well are involved into a lot of non-agricultural activities. So you could say, well, that's fine. We can still focus exclusively on agriculture and think that as people become richer because their agriculture, their agriculture becomes, uh, becomes, uh, uh, more productive that will generate some surplus and they can invest this surplus in some other activities. And there are examples of that. For example, very nice paper by uh, uh, Abhijit Banerjee and uh, Kaivan Munshi look at uh, a city in, uh, in South India called Tirupur, where, uh, which is now the, 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 the worldwide capital of, of T-shirts. And in the world, in this worldwide capital of T-shirt is in part made of people who came to the city to do t-shirts, but in part made of people who are, uh, are issued from the surrounding agricultural community called the Gonders, who are rich and have used, are using this money to set up little t-shirt factory in the city. 
So that's kind of one example where you see this happening. So this is not like a silly thing to say. However, using the same data set that I was describing before, uh, Andy Frost and Mike Rosenzweig look at the pattern of industrialization of employment in the rural, uh, in the rural villages. So what they ask is, uh, what predicts the fact that you have people in the village who are working in a factory, who are working for a wage in a factory, not as a small business, but in a factory? Is it, uh, do you find that in places which have had a lot of agricultural growth thanks to the Green Revolution, and therefore you would expect have developed surplus which have allowed them to set up these farms? Or is it in, in, in contrast in the places which have had slow um, agricultural growth that you do see this, this, uh, this, fac this factory setting up? And what they find is that this is very much the second thing, which is the substitution effect, if you will, uh, dominates the income effect. So in places which were particularly suitable for agricultural revolution, where the yield have increased uh, really fast, uh, there are not, not very many factories have been set up. And so the poetic justice is that those places are actually now lagging behind relative to the other places which, are, which were poor for agriculture, because in those places factories came up and the growth in wages in the industrial, fact, in the industrial sector is faster than the, the, than the growth in profit in agriculture. And that's particularly what they make the point, which I think is important, is that it's particularly important for the poor, because the poor have no or little land, so they're not the ones who benefit from the Green Revolution the most. So the Green Revolution is not partic helps people who are not particularly rich, of course, farmers, but it, among the farmer, it helps the, it helps the most the ones who have the most assets, whereas setting up a factory which will employ unskilled labor is actually benefiting the unskilled laborer and therefore is more equalizing. So that's uh, very interesting evidence. Another somewhat much, in a sense, more anecdotal, but uh, which very much resonates with that is uh, um, so still, Abhijit Banerjee and I have a second paper on the middle class, and we're trying to look at a lot of differences between the, the poor, like the economic lives of the poor, those who live under a dollar a day, and the middle class, which we define as those who live uh, with uh, more than two dollars a day and less than 10. And when you look at the sources of earnings, the big difference is not that the people in the middle class have bigger or better businesses, the big difference is that when they're employed, instead of working as casual laborer, they actually are employed for a salary, for a monthly salary. And you see these big differences is like, where it seems it really pivots is when people have access to a monthly and stable salary. So I think the notion of a good job, a good stable job in a factory, which I think was quite fashionable in, uh, in, uh, in development, let's say, uh, uh, 20 years ago, and has kind of gone away as we, as we uh, you know, trust the market and uh, the virtue of uh, 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 businesses and entrepreneurship, maybe needs to come back a little bit. That uh, the notion of what's a good job, like a good job is actually a stable job, and a lot of people would much rather work for a wage than have a small farm or a small, uh, or a small business. And that seems to set up a virtuous circle of human capital investment uh, so you see these people in the middle class investing much, much more in education, much more in health, etc. One, that's, it's not that I have evidence for that, but one uh, conjecture is that that's related to some extent to the sense of stability and aspiration and all of that that it can set up. So that sort of gels with the much more rigorous for, uh, Foster and Rosenzweig evidence about like the role of factories. So the conclusion of that is that agricultural growth will not be enough to develop rural areas, and you would want to find some way to develop uh, access to uh, businesses. It doesn't have to be industry. It could be BPOs or something, but uh, uh, some uh, like rel relatively larger businesses. So how are we going to do that? I still have my three parts, but I'm, going to, I'm changing a little bit the order. I'm going to start with agriculture, first things first, then provide some little tidbits on how to develop industries, so you will see that uh, it's not that I really know, and uh, conclude with the difficulty of providing services to the poor, which in a sense is the only thing I really know anything about, and uh, I should have spoken mainly about that, but uh, 
so that was finished by that. So, so let's start with agriculture. So I guess the, the big thing with agriculture, I would say that we've learned, maybe we've learned that more generally, is no magic bullet. Uh, one of the big thing about agriculture, like, so dams is an example of, I guess there are lots of magic bullets in development policy. They, su they, they succeed themselves, this one after the other. Dams was one for, uh, for a while. Um, so here, I think in this country or in rich countries, we more think of dam as an investment for, uh, for energy. But in a lot of developing countries, dams are actually designed to give uh, irrigation. So it's actually an, mainly an agricultural investment. So that's the case in, in India. So India has 4,000 dams, large dams. There's many more than dams than that, but 4,000 large dams. And they were once heralded as a solution to Indian agriculture. They were very much part of the Green Revolution movement that you need, you know, you need irrigation to have very dependable agriculture, and this is going to come from dams. And uh, yet, what we find in work with Roini Pandey on dams is that uh, when a dam is built, the productivity, the agricultural productivity, so agricultural productivity goes down and poverty goes up relative to the trend uh, in areas are, that are upstream to a dam. And of course, it goes in the direction you would want them to go downstream. Productivity goes up and poverty goes down, downstream from the dam. But the loss in productivity and the increase in poverty upstream are large enough to more or less balance the gain, uh, the gain downstream. So on balance, not only dams are not such a great, not so, not such a great investment. The rates of return we estimate come with their large confidence interval, but uh, they are not like phenomenal by any means. Like our point estimate is one percent. I wouldn't take that one home. That's why I didn't put it on the slide. But it's not huge. And the problem is that it also leads to this huge distributional impact. Uh, which, so it makes some people better off and it makes some people significantly worse off. Uh, that doesn't mean that it has to be the case. You could, you could think that, some, that it's a failure of policy rather than a failure of technology, that it, was, it would have been possible to redistribute to these areas, but somehow it didn't happen. And therefore, that makes the dams, uh, uh, I think, relative, uh, quite problematic as a, as a solution to agriculture. So it was like one example of no magic bullet. The reason why I bring it up here is more because I think people are not really thinking of dams now necessarily as a solution to agriculture in the developing world. It's more as a like tale of like more like cautionary tale about what are these like quick fixes and I mean it's not quick to build a dam but uh, su supposedly like universal solutions. Second thing I want to, to talk about is this idea of a new green revolution. Uh, so I think that's definitely a good idea to try and uh, develop new, new seeds for, uh, for, um, uh, for Africa. But we have to think about the question of behavior. Uh, and one example of that is that, so the problem of adoption of new seeds, new crops, new fertilizer is often viewed primarily as a technological issue. Like how can you uh, develop something that will actually work and not be bad for the environment and not, not generate monstrous mutant crops and this and that and the other. Uh, but yet a key issue after you develop a new technology is whether or not it's going to be adopted. And uh, the example of fertilizer adoption suggests that, uh, that I've studied now for many years in Kenya, suggests that the technology, after the technology is adopted, it takes a lot of work for it to actually be uh, uh, developed further. So if you look at fer uh, fertilizer, we're talking about really your uh, run-of-the-mill uh, uh, basic fertilizer that was invented decades ago and has very high rate of return and is not that hard to use. Um, and yet, the adoption rates are very low. So we found that, but this is, uh, Tafne Shuri found that before us. This is quite, uh, everybody agrees. So in our area, it's about uh, 20 to 40% from season to season of people use some kind of chemical fertilizer on their maize crop. The rate of return are very high. So you, we estimate that the rate of return of using fertilizer of about 75%. So that's something that you might want to do. It's hard to get a 75% return usually. Uh, 
The second fact is people are switching in and out of use. So it's in any season, it's 20 to 40% of people are using fertilizer, but it's not always the same 20 to 40%. Uh, so maybe something like 75 or 80% of people have tried and will go back to it at some point. People go back and in and out and in and out. Uh, this is also something that uh, Tavni Churi has found in a larger sample. And the last point which uh, Tavni Churi has found using a structural model in uh, using Kenyan data as well, is that she, what she does is she estimates where the, the profitability, the rates of return by different type of farmer, and she finds that it is not the ones who have the highest rate of return who are actually using it. Uh, so that is also a little bit surprising that it doesn't seem to be, the use doesn't seem to be related primarily to how much return you should have. So uh, Michael Kramer and John Robinson and I have spent uh, many years trying to understand these issues. And uh, it can sort of be summarized in two ways, in two, with two bullet points. One is that the diffusion of knowledge about fertilizer developed uh, is very low, which is in sharp contrast to what Foster and Rosenzweig have found for the Green Revolution in India. It's also in sharp contrast with what uh, uh, Chris Udry and Marcus, sorry, Chris Udry find for um, uh, for, um, um, for pineapple in work with Tim Conley, where in pineapple you can see that uh, both in pineapple and in, and, in, uh, uh, and in the Green Revolution, what you see is that when you see your neighbor doing something effective, you move in that direction. In our case, we don't find any of that. We find that uh, we introduce, we, basically what we do is that we select, we randomly select farmers and we do experiments on their plot. And the, value, and the experiments are the true field experiments, so which is we cut the field in two and we put some fertilizer on some, the, some of the field and not the other. And it's, there are two values to doing that. One is people see the returns directly, and the other is we can also tell them, show them how to do it, in particular the right quantity to use, uh, which, seems to be, uh, which people seem to be widely confused about, uh, how, what, what's the right quantity to use. And when you do that on people's farm, you can see that the next year they are more likely to use fertilizer and also more likely to use fertilizer in the right quantity. So the problem they have is if they use, they overuse. So they use about twice as much usually, like people use twice as much as they should on any, any given plant, which of course reduces the profitability a lot because uh, you, you have wasted a lot of the fertilizer. Um, so because, so one of the barriers to adoption is that uh, contrary to the Indian situation or the Ghana situation, we don't see knowledge diffusing. And it's not something, so in, in other words, our people who participate in our experiments use more the next year, but it is not the case for their neighbors and it is not the case for people who they claim they talk to about agriculture. And unless you think it's about Kenyans, that Kenyans are not like very talkative or they don't like to talk to each other, that's not true for other type of innovation in the same area. For example, uh, Pascaline Dupas has a paper on bed nets, and if you give bed nets to some people, their neighbors are more likely to go and get bed nets subsequently. So it is not that Kenyans don't talk, it's just they don't talk about agriculture. And you can, which you can verify by, by asking them, for example, simple question about themselves and their neighbor, like when did you plant, when did your neighbor plant? And when you ask them, you like, they are just, and not only that, but when did you plant and when does your friend whom you talk to about agriculture, when did they plant? And uh, people get it completely wrong. Like, so they don't know, they don't know anything about, so they don't seem to be talking too much about that. So that's one kind of, uh, one barrier, because A, good idea don't diffuse, and second, good practices don't diffuse, which reduces the profitability of those potential good ideas. The second barrier is uh, financing constraints, uh, which is it seems to be that farmers find it very difficult to save, even over a short period of time, and an intervention where we nudge them to buy fertilizer early in the season before the, the, the money of the harvest is gone uh, had big, has big impact on adoption of fertilizer. Those two things might be interrelate, interrelated in the sense that if you know that it's very likely that you won't have the money to buy the fertilizer anyway, why bother about trying to find out how your neighbor do it? Because you're not going to put this knowledge to use. 
So this sort of the, the, the takeaway point of this is that there's much more than technology to what's going, to what's happening. We need to understand behavior and we can see that it's quite subtle because it really depends on the context and uh, understanding why technology diffused in the Green Revolution in those and in Kenya will require some understanding of how uh, you know, the, different, the, the different setup, context, incentives, et cetera, et cetera. How about industry? So there's a number of uh, papers on that and a number of usual suspects which seem to deliver uh, what we expect them for delivering, uh, to deliver. So electrification increases the probability of diversification out of agriculture. It's a paper by Tari and Dinkelman, South Africa. Uh, financing, so the, um, India had a big expansion of rural banking, which is subsequently uh, uh, rolled, rolled down. But uh, uh, Robin Burgess and Roy Pandey have shown that uh, rural banking was associated not only with uh, poverty reduction, but also with diversification out of agriculture. Um, roads and railroads. So we have a paper with uh, Nancy Chen and Abhijit Banerjee looking at railroads in China and showing uh, much faster growth in rural counties, which happen to be on a straight line between a historical city, for example, Beijing, and a new uh, and uh, one of the new ports which were established uh, um, with the beginning of trade with the West of, say, Shanghai. So if you're on a straight line between Beijing and Shanghai, uh, you are close to a straight line between Beijing and Shanghai, you grow faster uh, and your, uh, in, in your urbanization like, grows faster, industrialization grows faster than if you're a little bit further away from this line after conditioning for the fact that you might be closer to Shanghai or Beijing. So it seems to be that being on the communication line has an impact uh, on, uh, on, on, on development. Now, this could be railroad, that's our main sort of channel, but it could also be roads or things like that. Other thing uh, interesting is small towns. Uh, one of the, still in the same set of studies that uh, Andy Foster and Mike Rosenfeld have on industrial, the growth of industrial employment in rural India, they show that uh, you're more likely to have an employment, to have um, a factory in your village or close to your village if you're closer to a town. So that suggests that uh, expanded public and private investment to develop smaller towns and their linkages to the village could play an important role in developing the rural areas uh, in the short run by creating construction jobs, because that's what a lot of people do uh, when, when they migrate for a short time, and in the longer run by attracting industry. And then I want to mention two things that uh, are maybe things that you think should be uh, solutions, but in my view probably aren't. One is uh, education. So you would think that, uh, that uh, educating the workforce would be a very good attractor for industries. And uh, I certainly did think that, uh, so I, I wrote a paper about it, trying to prove it. And um, in fact, I didn't find any of that. So in Indonesia, they have, there was very fast increase in education attainment due to a school construction program. And the people who were educated benefit com compared to their slightly older brothers who didn't benefit from the schools. But if you look at the, the, the place as a whole doesn't seem to that much benefit from having the, from, from having the extra schools. It seems that uh, um, uh, the, the higher productivity of the younger cohort comes more to the expense of the older cohort uh, rather than uh, an, an, a reason why the capital would come. So it seems that capital didn't follow the, the educated workforce. So that doesn't mean that it will always be like that, but it means probably that education is not sufficient. You need at least something else. They think some other barrier to the flow of funds, uh, and the flow of funds doesn't necessarily go where it's the most efficient. Uh, so that's related to some work that uh, uh, Cheng uh, and Pete have been doing on misallocation in general. Another one that I wanted to mention is microcredit. Uh, see here, just because sort of no, more like on first principle, because microcredit is not going to be useful to start industries. Microcredit is going to be useful to start small businesses, which might be great for people who start small businesses. But the, if we go back to the foster Rosenzweig evidence, the big, growth, the big ticket item are people working in factories. And so it might more be a poverty alleviation tool for people who are 
now in the village waiting for the good jobs, but not probably a source of creating those good jobs. Let me finish with the public services. Um, so we, should, we found some evidence uh, early on that uh, governments have, uh, that the, the state of uh, public health care, public education in, in rural areas of poor countries is, is, is rather bad. And it doesn't mean that governments have not been trying. In fact, they've been quite good at building facilities. I gave the example of the Indonesian government which builds thousands of schools in a very short period of time. That's an extreme example, but, uh, but, not, uh, but a lot of countries have had some movement of the form. Uh, so governments have been good at building facilities and really bad at ensuring that they are actually providing anything of value. So you have a school, but you don't really have people inside it. Oh, and one thing that is worth pointing out is that it is usually not the case that you have a school, but you have nobody appointed to the school, which is something that maybe people were saying that you know, it's ghost doctors, you have a school, but nobody's appointed. Here you have a school, someone is appointed, but they're not, 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 actually, not actually coming. And that has been much, much harder to achieve for a lot of developing countries. So, the resp and, and so one possible response to that is that, and that's the case for many development economist uh, esteemed colleagues of mine, is like, this suggests you should stop worrying about public services because if there were any demand for those services, since the government is trying, they're building the school, they're appointing someone, if people really wanted those services, they would figure some way out to get them to come. So in response to a lot of our work, which has been to try and improve the quality of education by having incentive for teachers or whatever, you know, a response is like, why are you wanting to do that? Like, if this is not happening, it's because the demand is not there. And I would, I disagree with this point rather strongly because there seems to be a huge demand for healthcare and for, uh, for education, and we see that in two ways. Number one, people spend a ton of money on health in those same uh, um, surveys that we have, we find people spending, let's say on average from country to country, an average of 5% of their budget on healthcare. In, the, in Udaipur, where people are extremely poor, um, in our survey, the, the average is 7%, which is more than what people spend in the US out of pocket on healthcare. So people do spend money on healthcare. They do spend money on education too, despite the fact that most schools are free. Um, the, uh, Private schools are developing extremely fast, and in the states where, for example, in Uttar Pradesh in India, where the, the quality of public education is really bad, well, there are, there are private schools everywhere. And what the poor do is that they, they send their kids to a private school, which is cheap, which caters exactly to people who don't have much money. And they wouldn't be private schools if there was, was not a demand, if there were no demand for primary education. Uh, in, what we find in, in Udaipur is that half the visits to to a doctor, to a provider, are visits to a modern uh, doctor who is private. The doctor in quotes, because not all the doctors have doctor's degree. In fact, about half of them have no, uh, no doctor's degree uh, or, or equivalent. And, but they are not, so, and those doctors are further away than the public health facilities. They are more expensive, and they, they, um, they also are less qualified. So that suggests that people do want something uh, and that the governments have not yet managing to, to provide that, but maybe that the role of the government in developing the rural areas must change from provider to regulator slash financiers with, like, with vouchers or things like that and oops, trying to regulate like, the, the vast offering both in education and in health, like the quality can go from pathetic to pretty good and try to, uh, to, to have that thing. And it's difficult given that the demand that we observe, we do observe a lot of demand, but the demand might not be for what we consider to be right. So for example, uh, there's a lot of demand for English medium education, but it could be like English medium education. Um, and in health, uh, there is uh, at least a lot of supply, but I think that really corresponds to an underlying demand for shots and drips. So if you go to a private doctor, 63% of the case, you're going to have a, a, a shot, which can be a steroid or an antibiotic, usually a single dose of antibiotic, or, um, or a, if it's a drip, it's usually a glucose drip. 
uh, which has a number of issues, like glucose drip, I guess, is sort of fine, but uh, the one dose of antibiotic has led to the spread of antibiotic resistance, uh, and the response to that is to, pro to prescribe better and better antibiotic, and, the, and the, the, resistance, the resistance follow. So it seems that, like, and it's very difficult for people, of course, to understand so the government, to on exactly what will work, they do feel better after a shot of antibiotics, so it's rational for them to want it. So there is a lot of work there in terms of, you know, what, how to canalize this demand, how to educate people, how to, uh, how to do better. And for that, I think it's going to be extremely important for someone, and I think this someone has to be a government to have credibility. And it's going to be a bit easier to have credibility if, at the same time, you're not providing pathetic uh, uh, social services. So that's sort of more, uh, more tentative here. So one, one uh, possibility is, given those difficulties, is why bother? You know, why wouldn't you, you know, isn't one, it, given that it's very difficult, and it's, in some sense, it doesn't, you know, trying to make the nurses to come uh, to a center doesn't really make for very exciting headlines. So there's a lot of temptation to just give up and focus on either on the cities or even if it's rural area, focus on big infrastructure, you know, big, build highways, things like that, which are great. But uh, why, so maybe it's actually the rational things to do from a political economy perspective is to say, well, let's not try the social services. It's too difficult. We're not really going to make any big progress and the little by little progress that we could make is not going to be enough. Let's just build roads, hope the country become richer, and then the social services will follow. So I don't think that's an absurd point of view whatsoever, but I don't agree <laughs> with it anyway for, for, uh, for two reasons. One is that we, as should, be, should have been clear in my, in my description of the, what will promote industries, we don't really know very well. Like, it seems to be that we don't really understand uh, why uh, industries suddenly start developing in a place and not in another, and what, what is the spark that gets people going. So if we knew for sure, maybe we could put a lot of energy in that, but we don't know for sure. There again, there is a lot of trial and error. So it might take some time, and we can't really count on it, and in the meantime, I think there are two arguments to be made. One is that it's quite likely that a healthy, educated population is more likely to find employment in those new factories once someone builds them. So what I told you before is that the education is not sufficient for people to build your factory there. But once you have your factory, if the factory doesn't find educated labor there, the educated labor will move. So the people who are here would certainly benefit from the factory more if they were educated. So that's probably not a very risky proposition to try and provide basic level of human capital while waiting for the industry to show up. The second is uh, a political imperative, which in my view is very strong, which is I don't think the poor in rural, areas are going, uh, in rural areas are going to sit quietly waiting for their turn to get the trickle down growth from the, from the cities. Uh, one of the things, for example, that uh, paper by uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Lakshmi Ayer show is that in places which have a history of more inequality due to the historical uh, ways in which the taxation revenue were set up, you have today much more of the Naxalite violent, violent Maoist movement in India. So this seems to be uh, related to the fact that after a while people get a bit upset if they're not getting uh, uh, their, their share of the, of the cake. And uh, I think their share of the cake is a better quality of life. And that, I think, goes through these services that they want, like health and education. So the, the conclusion of that is we've continued to try this out in, in this as in the other two. Thank you very much. So, um, I'll, I'll just take some questions. Yes. Uh, so uh, there's a microphone that will be passed around. Uh, so, I, I guess in the middle of your talk, when you, you were talking about the stuff by Mark and, 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 and Andy, I thought that you, 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 you were going to end up with the co 
conclusion that the key to rural development is to figure out what allows for growth in the non-farm uh, sector, uh, non-farm sector. But then you sort of, uh, the, the, it, it, it sort of got muddled in a bit by by uh, discussion about the importance of the green, uh, of having a green revolution for uh, for, for, for uh, Africa. But I, I guess my reading of the, the way that you are spinning the, the, the stuff by, by Mark and Andy is that a green revolution of of, uh, for Africa is really not the answer. Is, is, is really not the answer. So the question, I guess, is, you know, so y you, you seem to be saying that you sort of want both things, you, you want both things, but if you were forced to allocate your scarce resources, your, your, uh, or you, if you're forced to allocate your time, uh, your, 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 your time, what, what would you rather have the answer to? The, you know, how to bring about a green, re 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 a green re revolution in, in Africa? Or or how to bring about a rural industrial revolution in Africa? Um, do you want okay, to why don't you answer one by one this time? Um, so I, I think I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with your reading of, uh, of the two, which is I think what comes out of, uh, comes out of, uh, of Andy and Mark stuff is that uh, uh, the, Two, two things. One is that the, the industrial employment, like employment in factory goes faster to bring, peop to bring people out of poverty, increases income faster. And second is it doesn't follow from the, or it has not followed uh, from the Green Revolution in the case of India. It's sort of been substitute with it. Which, where well, you would conclude that finding ways to, uh, to promote industrial employment in Africa would be like a priority. Uh, so why did so why did I talk about agriculture uh, at the risk of mudding the water? Well, number one is sort of we know some stuff, so I thought I would say them. Uh, <laughs> I've, then I've done some work in it, so I like don't want to throw it in the <laughs> to, to uh, forget it. But so in part, it's a little bit. Uh, the reason why one might want to do both is that uh, I, I think we, we may have less of, so there are two reasons. One is, so one is, this is the same thing with the public good, is that there is a here and now question, which is like here and now you have people and they are farmers, so let them use fertilizer and they are going to be better off today. And I am very much, like this is a bit what I concluded with the social services, but that applies to agriculture, is that we can't just wait for things to happen. Like there are things, there are reasons both for moral reason and for political reason that means that it's hard to wait. And maybe agriculture is as more low hanging fruit. So that's one reason. Uh, that, and the second is we don't, yeah, we don't really know what to do, so people should think about it a lot and I am trying to think about it, but I'm slow, and like so people, sh you know, everybody should think about it. But that's why, you know, if someone is interested in agriculture, I think that there is great social value in trying to to do that as well. So that's the. Yes. Uh, I see a huge role for them. <laughs> Uh, so, what I try to do today is really like sort of give you a, sort of a very bird view of the where the place I see the field, where oh, not even a field, but some this this reflection and a lot of this work by was not was not by me, was by various people using various methods, and I may have made them sound more general than they are because in a lot of cases it's actually in-depth study of something not necessarily of an anthropological kind, but already looking in quite a bit of detail at one specific application and trying to learn from, from there. So for example, in the case of the fertilizer case, we've been trying to understand this problem since 2002. And uh, it goes into two lines, of a, two, two lines of a slide, but there is actually a lot of de depth behind it. Not, an, not enough depth, I'm sure, and not as much depth as you get from, from anthropological studies. But, uh, but some, and I think this 
in a lot of cases, I think the best economic studies rest on a lot of those anthropological studies to at least give you some direction about what to look for and uh, what might be interesting. For example, uh, you know, I didn't talk about property right here, but Chris has work on property right, which is economic work, but it's really based on like page and volumes and volume of anthropological work, so it would not have been possible without this. So. Okay, I'll, I'll move upstairs. Uh, Mushfik first. I wanted to get a bit more clarification. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, hold on. We'll have somebody up. We have a competition of like. Then, oh, we'll okay. give you. The <laughs> I go. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to get uh, some clarification on two different parts of the presentation. So when we earlier when we were talking about uh, technologies like fertilizer, um, we you know you seem to concentrate on the demand side that we really need to understand the behavioral constraints, learning, etc. Why people don't demand these technologies that have been developed, uh, or you also use the example of bed nets. But then later on in the presentation, when we were talking about public services, um, you were also saying that we, we need to look at how to get you know, some supply side innovation, such as uh, reducing absenteeism or, uh, or, or developing new technologies. Uh, so again, in the flavor of Chang's question, you know, how do we prioritize? Is it really a demand issue or a supply issue or a combination? Um, and, and a se second part of the question is, while well, we have the mic upstairs, um, <laughs> Uh, something that throughout the presentation I was discussing with Raj and David is a, a lot of these issues are in, you know, interlinked. So industrialization versus agriculture, they are linked, they're general equilibrium effects in the sense that they're, you know, industry and agriculture compete for labor, for capital, for water, for electricity. Right? Um, and can we really answer the question in partial equilibrium that we go with agriculture or with industry? So the second part of the question, that's exactly what the Foster and Rosenzweig study tried to do is to uh, is to basically they are trying to, un to 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 integrate the two in a general equilibrium framework, and they are making exactly this point. And in principle, you wouldn't know whether so the whether it's substitute or complement industrialization and uh, and agriculture could be one or the other, uh, and because they're competing for labor, that makes them substitute. On the other hand, if they are credit constrained or things like that, generating resources makes them in agriculture could uh, generate the capital that make industry comes up that would make them complement. And that's exactly the question they are trying, they, they are asking and, and that they answer very much from saying they are, they, are, they are substitutes. So it's one example where, uh, where this was, uh, this effort was being made. I agree that uh, there, is, there is, I mean, we get a lot of insight from this work and uh, when we'd get more from doing more of it. On the second one, uh, so in the in part is sort of the the problem of uh, you know talking about, about a lot of issue in 45 minutes. So I think in both cases you might have demand and supply. The reason why I insisted, I, so in particular I, I said this very briefly. I don't think there is no demand problem in the in the case of social services. Uh, it's more like I think the level of demand is there. It's more the what people demand that is that that we need to understand why they demand, they, they have this huge demand for curative services and one-shot antibiotic and at the same time no demand for humanizing their children. So, and it's the same children, so it's not because they don't like their children. So it's, so we have to, uh, so that is sort of very, sort of really interesting demand issue on that side. On the, for fertilizer, uh, I focused on, on, on demand issue because I, th I think those, I'm not saying there are no supply issues with fertilizer, but at least in Kenya, in usually it's not first order, because usually the shops just offer fertilizer. Sometimes there are, there are problems, but it doesn't seem to be like one like overwhelming barrier at the moment. It's been historically, uh, but not, not, not right now. Um, we have something on dams in the back. Sorry about that initially. I just wanted you to re-explain the example of the negative effects of the dam. That's okay. So there is a technological thing, which is, so a dam, when you build a dam, you need to, so I'm going to caricature that a lot, but so it's a, it's a model, let's say. When you build a dam, you have to have a big 
barrage, a, a big leak, and then all the rivers comes. And so what happens is that the two things: one is the the the, fi the field around the lake gets waterlogged, so it becomes like a sponge, absorbs the water, the, the pH of the land change, so the land becomes less productive, like in a big area, not only the area of the, of the lake. And then it also if you want to have water in your lake, which you need to redistribute the water, you need to, people shouldn't use water from the river to irrigate. I irrigate. So in particular when things are dry, you're going to ask people not to irrigate. So for the people who are upstream, technologically it's not a good thing. So that's known. That's the advantage, of course, is downstream, it's, everything's much better. Because now you can control the irrigation and things like that. So that's a technological reason for why it's better to have a dam. It, it's not good to be, upstream from a, uh, to be upstream from a dam, it's good to be downstream. And then, of course, comes politics and redistribution, because since this is all known, once you want to have a dam, you should find a way for the people downstream who are winners to compensate the losers. But this is what has been, has been difficult to do. So back upstairs. You said that uh, large irrigation dams can serve as no magic bullet. But what about small scale hydro energy uh, dams to generate localized energy solutions, electrification. And then you said that because of perhaps higher transportation cost, people go and come back. Um, so what about lower transportation, uh, increasing uh, mobility and uh, making commute from rural areas to urban cities or industries affordable? Thank you. Right, so I know very little about microhydro, so I'm not going to, you know, someone should look at it. And in fact, I think there is, at least, I think Ben Olken was at least trying to do a project on that, but I don't know whether it is happening, or that, but that's very interesting. And there's great demand from the IGC agriculture program for such research. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little bit expensive because even micro, it's expensive per dam. So if someone has a lot of money to, randomly placed micro hydro <laughs> project. I'm sure someone will study it. Uh, the second, on the commute, I, you're exactly right. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, being next to a road or a railroad is a good deal. Okay, I'll take, I'll take three questions from down here and, uh, because we're doing great, but the demand for uh, the Esther's time is now appearing to be much larger than the supply. So let's go one, then two, then three. Um, it seems right now in the NGO community especially, the big focus is on construction projects, constructions of schools in Africa, construction of, or as you mentioned, the Gates Foundation, where it's funding primarily ecological or small business type of projects. Do you see that there's ever going to be, or that there could be, the political will for what are in essence industrialization projects that environmental and Western governments seem to have significant restrictions and reservations about. Okay. I forgot who I said was number two. I don't want to cheat the person I said was number two. All right, go ahead. Um, what about political structures? Will devolving lawmaking powers to rural areas help development? Which, 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 which type of structure? Political. Okay, and then the third was in the back. It was you, yeah. Oh, so you'll be the fourth. <laughs> I think Go ahead. I, I'd like to address uh, your comment about providing public infrastructure, which is not exactly what people are looking for. Um, and I was wondering in your research whether you found that people were looking in terms of education for more vocational training or skills training for to, to be able to d go and take up temporary jobs in the city. And in terms of health, whether they were looking for traditional methods of health that they were used to particularly in India uh, compared to modern healthcare systems. Okay, and then number four was here. I, I had a quick question about um, clarity on the urbanization issue. It sounded like at the beginning of the talk, you said urbanization wasn't the answer to these problems, but later in the talk, you talked about how factories really, you know, factory jobs in particular, were the, the way that people were going to the middle class. And it seems like the logic conclusion, logical conclusion of that is that you would have small towns and therefore sort of a mini urbanization as your development solution. And 
I just wanted you to clarify that, that for me. Okay. So on the, so I don't know if a lot of, the, if the focus is now on constructing, I think we've, like, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of, now the, I don't know what the focus of NGOs is, but I don't know if it's fair to say that NGOs are only into building, I think NGOs are more into capacity building and things like that, a lot of them now. Uh, but I, let me rebound on the industrialization question and uh, and one of the things that in some sense I realize I should have mentioned as an example, very interesting is uh, of the fact that you do need to provide public goods in order to get some support for industrialization is what's happening now in what has happened in India. So the West Bengal government, nice, you know, communist government in principle pro poor all that, have uh, uh, really become industrialization friendly uh, and in particular developed uh, sort of uh, I've tried to attract businesses to start a uh, big uh, industrialization project in rural area, which could have given a lot of uh, employment there. And this didn't work out. Uh, there was a huge uh, rally against it, partly organized for political reason, for someone's political interest, but, but there was enough like demand to go along with it to derail the project essentially. And the reason why it was the case is that it, it was going to be, someone's lens was going to have to be taken away. They had to make a deal. They were, unable, they were not able to make that deal to the satisfaction of everybody involved. And I think this is related to this huge mistrust, related to slightly, in a long way, long-winded way to the dam's failure, which is, you know, fine, you're taking our land, like how, how are we going to get benefit from that? Can we believe you? I think the credibility was very low. And the credibility is low in part because of these other things <laughs> that haven't happened. Hence, the, I think the key need to keep the people with you is the program. And that's, that's one of the sort of links back to that. So that's, thank you for bringing this up because I think that's the key, that's very important. Um, that maybe answered the political structure question a uh, little bit to an extent. Uh, um, uh, the vocational training, um, uh, vocational training and traditional method. So traditional method, I think people, yeah, about a quarter of the visits in, in, in our sample are to traditional healer, but then another half are, are to modern private doctors. So I think there is a demand and people have a system. There are things that they will go to the traditional healer for and there are things that they will go for modern medicine for. They are very, like, rational about it. They are very sophisticated about what, and in fact, what you see them go to the traditional healer for are symptoms of chronic diseases, where it would be, a, where in a sense probably the, the modern doctor they see are not in a position to treat them. And that's where we see, okay, if the public service was doing their job, you know, they would, they would actually be able to be treated for the chronic condition. Uh, but since they cannot, then it's why not go to the traditional healer. They are very sophisticated about that. Uh, vocational training is a very interesting question. Uh, there is, a, it, we don't know enough about that, I think, and, and th there, is, there is a project, a study underway by uh, Ted Miguel, Michael Kramer, and others looking at that in Kenya. There's a lot of interest now in um, vocational training, and NGOs are getting into that, and that seems very interesting to look at, interesting thing to look at. Uh, the distinction between the, the um, sort of what I said at the beginning is that and uh, so first is you can have factory in rural areas, and you do, like in, that's like something that is really interesting in the Foster and Rosenzweig data is like these factories in villages. Now they become like, the villages become bigger. And so in that sense, you know, so the distinction is between people going to Bombay, or even if it's not Bombay, you know, Berampur, which is the capital of the district, another district, versus like, the city next to you growing. So I think we are more, maybe the answer is more that than people going to the bigger city. Okay, let's go back upstairs. There were a bunch of questions on this side. This right in front and then in back and then in the middle. I haven't heard a lot of talk about just trade policy as it relates to agriculture um, inequality and lack of access. And to me it seems sort of like the white elephant in the room um, subsidies to, to U.S. And, and EU farmers. 
and how that actually affects um, the possibility for agricultural development, particularly in Africa. And then a quick second point, just to um, hear your thoughts about what differences um, would have to exist between um, an African green revolution versus the one that happened in India, because Africa has so many um, different climates, different crop varietals and things like that. Um, has that really been accounted for um, in, in putting that together? And then the third one was in the middle. Uh, actually, I uh, uh, like the thought of you uh, separating the cities from the villages and trying to make the villages better equipped and building more cities closer to, to each other. But uh, it's a small fact, but then a small point, but how do you actually insulate these, the cities you want to develop, or uh, towns rather, villages or towns, from the evils of the cities, like, you know, uh, the increase of smoking or availability of cheap alcohol in uh, these newly developed uh, cities of yours. From, I mean, how do you insulate the people from these evils? I mean, they, they fall into the cycle of rural people going to the uh, cities and, you know, falling into the trap of these the city evils. Sort of thing. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the. Uh it tends to be the poorest and the richest who are the most mobile. I was wondering, could that be related to, let's say, poor transferability of land and mm -hmm. poor ability to outsource the production for small-scale farmers? So, which basically means that they have to work their own land to derive any benefit from it, which prevents them from, let's say, specializing from going to the cities for longer periods. So if the institutions were strengthened to allow them to, uh, let's say, outsource production to, uh, for example, the, land, the landless, uh, could that essentially start some virtuous circle whereby they could increase their skills and focus full time on non-farm work? Um, so let me start by this one. Yeah, I agree. I mean, more generally, I think I should have been talking about property rights. Uh, more, and I think that that could. The, the point I was making at that point was actually purely theoretical. So it's uh, so it's another theory for the same fact, which seems to be to be a quite a reasonable theory. Uh, um, I don't. Uh, for the second question, I don't think that the share of budgets going to alcohol and tobacco is higher in cities than in rural, rural areas. So I don't know if you need to really insulate anybody from anything in that way. Uh, for the first one, so the African Green Revolution, in terms of the variety and all that, that's exactly what they're working on. That's why, that's the technological fix, if you want. That's exactly that. It's trying to develop variety that would work well, work well for Africa in the same way, in the sense that the first Green Revolution was about developing good varieties for, for South Asia. Uh, on trade, uh, I agree with you, in a sense, uh, so the only excuse or somehow, like the, the only place where it came up a little bit is in when I talked about flour and fruits and things like that, and presumably then it would need to be a market to send those stuff to, for, for them, and that, that's related to trade policy. Uh, the only excuse for not, not mentioning further is that I really don't know very much about it. So. Okay, so we're getting close to the end, but I'd like to take one last group of questions from, from downstairs now on this side, since I haven't been looking there. So I see right, right in front, and then here, and then in the back. There's one. Well, there's two. One, two in the back. So one, two, three, four. Okay. All right, well, two goes first. Um, hi. Um, my question was about dealing with, uh, so I agree with voucher systems for education but I somehow feel that you need some sort of standardization to ma ensure that there's a decent quality of education. And also there's a question of discrimination. So, because a lot of places in schools, there's caste discrimination, for example. And uh, for example, there are these uh, Islamic schools. So if you allowed private schools, would it be that there is a certain section of society which did its own schools, which did not get a standardized education? Anti-poverty 
Yes, may I ask you, uh, what is your model of uh, economic growth in a rural area? It looks like uh, uh, this is just an, elen uh, an index of problems and problems. I would like to have some kind of, uh, give to us a sustainable model that you think is feasible as a general. So, and uh, how do you, uh, what is your reaction, for instance, rural and urban to give uh, a balance a common sustainable development based on knowledge, not based just on policy action. Thank you. Uh, from what I know, and uh, welfare cost is very high. And uh, how could you reckon balance the development and welfare? And uh, I was want to know um, uh, how Indians succeeded. They, they seem to have free hospitals everywhere. And uh, I don't know how they balance the, the development and the welfare. Okay. No. Okay, I, I, I don't think she understood quite the, end, the last welfare. part of your sentence. Yeah. yeah. And, and the welfare cost of what? Or the, or the cost of providing welfare program, not yeah. the welfare uh, cost yeah, of. Yeah, for my okay. note, like for example, like in Germany, it's about one third of GDP go to the welfare spending. And uh, you know, it's not uh, very, very, very costly. And for, uh, for developing countries, uh, so we, for example, on a rural area, obviously, it's very poor. How could you balance it both? How do you develop and at the same time you get the welfare? And the same as the Indians, they have like the free hospitals everywhere. I think how they how did they succeed? Okay. And could you pass it behind you? Coming back to the industrialization of rural areas, I wanted to ask you um, whether there's currently any research on the role of government as regular. And, and I, I, so, so Rosenzweig and Foster, well, Rosenzweig is my colleague, but I think, I think taking the lesson of that work to Africa is much more difficult. Um, and I think it's largely because of the, the fundamental difference in the distribution of land in Africa versus in India. A green revolution in Africa has really remarkably different consequences, I think, for the pattern of economic growth in a rural community than it did in India, where land is much more concentratedly held. I mean, as a consequence, I think the, the knock-on effects on non-farm employment could be fundamentally different. And even in India, I think um, the vast majority of that non-farm employment was, was just that, non-farm employment, not in factories. There was a little bit in factories. Um, well, mainly in fact, ma there were many uh, factories, but still mainly in factories is, is a big thing. It's mainly like okay, for well, wages I mean, okay. and things like that. That's yeah, what it's, that's it's yeah. the growth was mostly in wages, but there's still this massive amount of non-farm self-employment. So okay, good. Um, so, so let me. Uh, so I'll take. I'll, uh, so on the standardization, yes, totally. That's the thing. That's why you cannot just have. You have to, that's why I'm saying that the role of, uh, like the government has to move into being the one who is providing the standards, uh, which might, and there might be a trade-off between the per being, being the institution that provides the standard and then having your own credibility at stake on other things. If, uh, and so, but standardization is key. That said, the point on Islamic school along the way, I should mention where you would think there is a lot of Islamic school in Pakistan, in, in is almost none. Like this, very, very little. That's very interesting work by Astin Kwaja and Jishnu Das, showing that the fraction of kids who are going to Islamic school in Pakistan is tiny. Uh, so maybe this fear is not so uh, big. Um, so that sort of links to the second, to the question on on, on cash transfer. I, 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 I agree, and in fact, a lot of countries have sort of moved in that direction with the conditional cash transfer, and some of them are not that conditional. One big issue there is how do you allocate them, and how do you know who is poor? Like, once you, when you offer a service, and in particular, if you offer a service of dubious quality, then you have sort of mechanical 
self-screening, like the rich kids in rural areas will not go to the public schools, they will pay for private school, so there is an automatic screening out of it. But when you want to give a cash transfer, you have to know who is poor, otherwise it becomes really expensive, and that's a big issue. And that's kind of what the uh, NREGA, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, is trying to do, is by asking people, it's a cash transfer really, because the work is not much, but by asking people to work, you are supposed to move away the people who don't really need it. The problem is that there is a big tendency in this kind of program to move towards nobody is really working because it's not in the interest of the villager to actually work. It's not in the interest, you know, you can say, okay, instead of paying you 100, 100 rupees for a day of work, I'm going to pay you 80 rupees for a day of staying at home and pocket the 20 rupees. That's everybody has the advantage to do that. And so the work guarantee, because of the risk of corruption that everybody is complicit in, the work guarantee scheme are not necessarily a very good way to self-screen. So then the issue is, how are you going to self-screen? And I don't think this issue has been, has been satisfactorily resolved and they would, it would be a pretty important part of figuring out how to do a cash transfer. Um, what's my model economic growth in rural areas? I guess if I really knew, uh, I would have told you. I would, <laughs> I, uh, I would have, I would have, I, I would not have held this news. Uh, I think it goes back to a little bit my conversation with Chiang. I think we have a little bit of evidence. Uh, you know, we have some models, and like for example, I think the Foster Rosen spike is one thing. Is you, you know, for some reason that we don't fully understand. Maybe it's closer to a town. Maybe there is a good road. Something like that. A factory starts, and then people start working in this factory, and. Uh, start investing in human capital, and then the whole place kind of become richer. And so that's one possible model. That, that's the model that they push for, for India. Uh, let me move immediately to Chris's question in this context. I, I agree, I should, have, I, should have mentioned, I should have mentioned that ex explicitly. I mean, we don't know since nobody did the equivalent of the, the, the equivalent study in, in Africa. I think we have, I, I completely subscribe to your reasons for why it might be vastly, uh, vastly different. I, I, on the factual point, I think they do make a big deal of saying this is not non-farm employment, but it is true that in our survey we have what people do, and we have a lot of non-farm self-employment in other countries. A lot uh, of their villages are now towns. Yeah, I think that's the village, the and their villages have become towns. So in our surveys where rural is really rural, we have actually a lot of uh, we have actually a lot of people who are working in uh, in in self-employed uh, businesses. But totally, it's that's sort of maybe would have been should have been my answer to Chiang is that we should uh, we need to figure it out because after all, it might be that in, in Africa it's going to start from there. Um, so in terms of the the cost of providing this program, so. Uh, Poor countries spend much less. India's expenditure on health, use public expenditure on health used to be 0.9% of GDP. It's now increased to 3%, still seems much less than what the other countries are spending, and, and correspondingly, the quality of the services is also lower. Um, I don't know, I'm not aware of studies uh, looking in developing countries as impact of incentives for firms to locate uh, in rural areas. Maybe other people here know. Uh, that seems like, uh, I don't know if countries have really done that, uh, but that seems like it would be an interesting thing to t study if, it's, if there is such an experience. Okay. Well, we're only 10 minutes over, so I'm very proud of us. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Professor Esther Duflo for coming and, and giving us such an interesting talk and, and answering our questions. I'd like to thank you for your attention and for the great set of questions we had. So thank you all very much.